my name is Mike Bloomberg and I'm a librarian. Uh, with me today are Ron Kerpiers and Caroline Wack. Wack, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm facilitating and we would ask you to all keep yourself commuted during presentations. We will have a discussion period at the end. Um, if you have questions or comments, you can type them into chat and I will bring them forward during the discussion period or just let me know in chat that you would like to be recognized. Uh, we are recording this session. Um, and there may be uh, portions of it that are used by Marcom for uh, marketing purposes. Um, so I'll recognize Ron Kerpiers, and he's going to talk about electronic resources. All right, I'd like to share my screen now and we will get into um, one second. Let me minimize this. And we will begin the slideshow. All right, uh, thanks for joining us today. And the um, title is Don't Overdo It, How Librarians Can Help You Effectively Find and use electronic resources. We're gonna focus primarily on electronic resources today. And it's actually divided into two parts. The first part will be library licensed electronic resources, things that we pay for. And that would include streaming videos, journals, and electronic books. And as Mike said, I'm Ron Kerpiers. I'm one of the, uh, one of the librarians here at Augsburg. I'm the collection management librarian. The second part will be finding and using open educational resources. And that will be presented by one of our newest librarians, Caroline Walk. And I want you to keep in mind that both of these will offer innovative pedagogical opportunities and will save students money. I'd like to begin with a story. And this is a true story. About eight years ago, there was a professor whose name may or may not be Professor B, um, decided that he was not going to use a textbook for his class. So he and I together came up with journal articles that we had electronic access to. He also was real big on using Harvard Business Review, which we have electronic access to going back to 1922, but Harvard has some stipulations, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And he also was interested in using case studies. So together we came up with resources that in his mind were learning objects that fit his course objectives. The second uh, story I wanna relate is another professor uh, who uh, may or may not be Professor G who was using a, an article and a simulation that mentioned the, uh, some of the aspects and then referred to the film Invictus. So he contacted me and said, can you help me out with this? So what he then decided to do, so we leased the film Invictus and he figured out how to get it to work for streaming into his course. Now, the next semester that that course was taught, there was a increase in enrollment so they contacted another professor, Professor T, may or may not be his name, um, who taught at Augsburg for over 30 years. And what I heard back from him is, I don't know how to fit this in. Well, the model that Professor T was used to using is that you use class time to show the film. Well, once he understood the aspect of streaming, that students could watch it at a time and place of their own choosing, he became a convert, so much so that the next course he taught for another program, he used a, a simulation for this group that uh, climbs Mount Everest. And then he on his own said, well, how about if we show the film with Jake Gyllenhaal that shows this group that climbs Mount Everest. But again, he requested the streaming access. So again, his students could do it at a time and a place of their own choosing. Okay. I'm with the adventure we're gonna go on today, I'm gonna to use one of my favorite fictional characters and that's Doctor Who. 
I don't know if we have any Doctor Who fans in the house, but what I would like to mention is that this was a long-running British uh, show that began in 1963. Unfortunately, as most of my favorite shows, it ended up getting canceled in 1989, but they brought it back in 2005. Now, what happened, or the, the premise of this, is Doctor Who was doing good and fighting evil, but he would kind of figure things out as he went. And they would go from actor to actor through a process called regeneration. Well, it seems to me that there was a whole lot of regeneration going on at Augsburg these last few weeks and, and several months. Um, I would also like to point out Doctor Who regenerated so much that this season, Doctor Who regenerated for the first time into a female character. Now, what often happened is Doctor Who was accompanied by a number of companions as they uh, made it through their series. So I would like you to think of the librarians as your companions as you go through these series. Now, Doctor Who would travel in this uh, machine called a TARDIS. And one of the comments that happens every time a stranger walks into the TARDIS is that it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. So as, as we explore some of these electronic resources, I hope you also have that thought of, gee, it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, that there are more resources available. Now, unfortunately, Doctor Who also encounters a lot of different foes as they make, their, make through their adventures. And I think we have some, I don't know if I should call them foes, but we have some challenges. So I think it's important to keep some uh, concepts in mind as we look for electronic resources. Oh, and one of the creepiest ones for me is the Weeping Angels. Of all the foes, that's the one that if you look at it, it won't move. But if you blink or look away, it gets real scary. So I invite you, uh, don't blink. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to be creating your own adventure with electronic resources. But I think it's important looking at, do the resources meet your course objective? To me, that's the, that's the paramount uh, concern here. And do they provide access? So all of the electronic things will provide access through the library page. But if you put in persistent links from each of them, your students into Moodle, all your student has to do is click on it and there it is. The other thing that's a concern is cost. Now, in all frankness, there would be a cost to the professor up front with time to figure out what resources would uh, best be good learning objects to meet my course objectives. But again, we can help with that. Now, from the other kind of idea is money. It would save the student money if they wouldn't have to buy additional uh, course packs or textbooks or whatever. And when you create the persistent link, it saves the student time. They just click on it and there it is. And I think in the long run, it will alleviate some stress levels. All right, so we're looking at te teaching and learning resources that can assist you as you go on. First, we're gonna look at films. All right, and the TARDIS will take us there. Now, when I first came to Augsburg, what I found is that our largest uh, vendor was called Films for the Humanities. And so uh, after, I guess it was about 12 years ago, they created a database called Films on Demand streaming of their collections. Now, I remember a time when what you did for a film is you had a reel-to-reel. -reel. Yes, I am that old. And then it went to uh, cassette tapes and then to DVDs. But again, the method of delivery was you showed it in class or possibly you put it on reserve in the library and just prayed to God that the students watched it. Now with uh, streaming options again, so Films have de On Demand has also added these other vendors. But with streaming options, students can watch it at a time and a place of their own choosing. As of Sunday, within the Films On Demand database, there were 41,494 separate titles. Now, in working with a professor in uh, the art department who was looking for digital photography, just putting in that term, uh, 258 results came up. 
Now, I do remember codec moments. So if the professor's objective was to look at how did digital photography first come about, there's a segment in that uh, 48-minute film about digital photography. And it did talk about, it interviews the man who worked for Kodak, who uh, invented digital, but Kodak wasn't interested in going forward with that project because it wasn't something that they could count as a unit to sell. Now, if the objective by the professor was to look, do students have a history of how digital photography came about and kind of the, some of the choices that companies made, this would be an excellent resource. Now, what he can do is, do you see what I have circled there, the link? He can put that link right into Moodle, or if he only wants them to see that segment on digital to photography, he can put the link just to that segment as well. And that's the segment that I've highlighted there. Now, if the professor was really, okay, I don't want the history, I want them just to learn the mechanics. Here's another 12 minute film on how a digital camera works. Now, within this, we know we have students for whom English is a second language or who have some challenges. And so there are options here, they can click on that. And then the transcript is viewed as uh, with these bars that move along that the student can follow along as the, um, as the uh, vocal is, is, uh, is read. Or they could do the closed captioning if that would be a better option for them. So they have a couple of options. Now, do you see on the bottom of that screen all the tags? If there's more that the professor is interested in or the student, they could click on any of those tags and would bring up other films in the Films on Demand database that they would have access to. Now, anything in Films on Demand, we pay an annual fee and students can view it as many times as they want to and professors can preview as many as they want to and no additional cost is incurred. Here's an example of what the URL, so all the professor would have to do is copy and paste. So let's talk about the business model for a moment. Oh, don't blink. Good, I'm glad you didn't blink. All right, so in uh, effort, I want to follow the model that the administration of the college is setting as being transparent about the costs. This is how much we're paying for the general database on Films on Demand for this year. All right. Um, the second number that I have up there is uh, the 3060. The nursing department wanted the specialization. There is a collection of nursing films and primarily because the way nursing had been taught mostly in two different sites with a whole lot of uh, electronic access or streaming access needed, this was a perfect match for them. The second uh, vendor that I'd like to explore now is called Swank Digital Campus. Swank is a family-owned St. Louis company that's been around for 95 years. Well, historically, their biggest customers were like the student affairs department at colleges who would like show a film in the student union or prisons actually, where the prisoners would earn enough credits that they could go uh, to a, a assembly hall and watch a movie. Well, about six years ago, Swank found that they were being approached by a lot of uh, colleges saying we have professors who would like to show feature films in our classrooms. And so they created Swank Digital Campus. Now, the way Swank does it is they work with all of the major studios except one, and that's Fox. And in their entire 95 year history, Fox has never worked with them. Well, I got all excited when Disney bought Fox a year ago, thinking, oh, now this is our opportunity. Well, when it finally cleared the last uh, antitrust hurdle on a Friday, the following Monday, Disney announced that they're going to do their own streaming service. So, so far, um, Swank has not been given access to the Fox um, catalog. Now, let's look at some of these films. These are the ones we currently license. So I have a nursing professor who uses 12 Angry Men in a nursing communications class, MBA uh, ethics professor who uses Enron. We have accounting professors who use the Enron film as well. We have a religion professor who teaches death and dying who look, uh, requires the students to view 
what dreams may come or whose life is in any way. Um, we have a, a psychology professor who teaches abnormal psychology who for his final, the students have to do an analysis in one of the characters of Zootopia. Now again, students can view these at a time and a place of their choosing. They can view as many times as they want and not occur additional costs. Now the model though is a la carte. So professors contact me and we lease per film. So there's over 25,000 films available, but the business model, again, don't blink, is we pay $69 if the film the professor wants is for a semester only, or $120 if it's for the entire year. Now, professors have also contacted me saying, can I let other people in my department know? And I say an enthusiastic, yes, yes. Um, if we look at a, a, a business perspective of that, that we get more return on investment. Um, but the more people who use it, I think the better off we'll be in, in increasing our, our opportunities for learning objects. And the third one that I'd like to look at, oh, and this is the, what we paid this year for, um, for access to the Swank films. The third one I wanna look at is called Canopy, all right? Um, Canopy is mostly for, um, oh, for um, documentary films, classic films like Criterion, Kino Lorber, etc. All right. What we do for is over 26,000 titles in there. What we're doing for this, and this is Augsburg's first foray into patron driven acquisition. So it means that we have access to all 27,000 films to view, but on the fourth viewing, then we have triggered a purchase. And then we are charged $135 and we own that film for a year. So it's licensed. Now to Canopy's credit during this um, virus time right now, from March 18th through May 31st, we are only paying $100 per film. But the business model, it kind of went off the tracks again this year. So really, there was a whole lot of blinking. So, so far, Augsburg has spent $21,950 on the Canopy films. Um, now, we're not the only one who has experienced um, quite a sticker shock with Canopy. So because of that, there are a number of our colleagues who have dropped it. Um, so far, Augsburg has chosen not to drop it, but Canopy is coming up with um, new ways to deliver. So I wanna reassure you, you will still have access, but it might look different within the next few months. Um, it probably will become a model more like Swank where you actually have to request specific films. Um, but we have to figure out how can we make it sustainable going forward. I do have one suggestion though. If um, with the, remember I told you the, the um, fourth time it's viewed, we trigger a, a purchase. Um, what I would recommend is if you're just previewing films, preview for at least, sit down at a time when you can preview for at least 20 to 30 minutes. Um, because what we show from the usage data, a lot of people look at it for three minutes and then go on. Well, that then is counted as a trigger. Um, the other thing is if you're previewing it the, and you're using the same IP range, you then have, if you say, okay, I want to break for lunch. If you go back within 30 minutes, it's not charged as another trigger It's say, oh, the per same person is watching it. But if you go back tomorrow, then it's counted as a trigger. Now, the other question that comes up a lot is, once we've triggered it, do we keep paying? No, we have it then for a year and that $135 will not incur more costs on top of that for that film. So again, if something is triggered, multiple people can use it, your students can go back as many times as they want. All right. Um, so the way people can tell if it's been triggered is it will show if it has the play button, so it's ready for you to view. If it's not been triggered, you see where it says the buy now, and if you click on it, 
there'll be a request where you can request access to this film. And then that, that email will come to me. I'd like to now move on to what uh, uh, libraries have traditionally collected. So journals, okay. Now, as many of you as faculty know that journals are turning to electronic versions of it, will simplify the access of it. All right, so the TARDIS will take us to, if you want to know if Augsburg has access to a specific journal title, just click on that, go to journals by title, and it'll bring up this screen. In order to save you some time, I recommend changing the default line that it's in blue there to match exact titles. And I had a professor that was looking for the Journal of Marketing. And it then by clicking on that, it shows us where we have access. Now I find the most comprehensive coverage is in that second one, Business Source Premier, going back to 1936 to present. So I click on that. And if I look under the bibliographic record, it's indexed to present and it's full text to present. Now I've got a couple options here. I could click on the items on the side and it would allow the student to browse what is being written in the most recent uh, issues. Or in this case, I had an ergo student who was looking for this specific journal article. So I clicked on, on the left side where it said search within this publication. This is the article that the student was looking for, okay? Um, he was really doing research on celebrity endorsements and specifically a sales of tennis shoes by a specific um, sports figure. But do you see over on the right side, do you see what looks like a chain link fence there? By clicking on that, it will give you the persistent link that the professor could put that link into the Moodle page. So by clicking on that, all students would have access to that journal article. Again, no cost to them beyond what we pay for the database. And by clicking on that, Notice how the easy has the link has easy proxy in it. That's the um, a, a prefix that we put in so that students from on campus won't be then asked, um, you know, to log in uh, additionally into the database itself. So the database recognizes that this student is an, a member of the Augsburg community. All right, my, my evil characters now are the Daleks because I want to address what I mentioned earlier, the Harvard Business Review. Of all the journals that we get in any of our subscription packages, this is the only one that does not allow persistent links into Moodle. All right, I have fought with them and I get nowhere with them. Their first response to me was, well, we didn't know professors were gonna use it for academic study. My response was, what did you think they would use it for? And then their second response to me is, well, we'll sell you access, which seems ridiculous because we're already paying for access. So what you need to know is your students still have access going back to 1922 through current, but they have to put, you have to give them the citation and then they go to the database and they find the journal article. Now, adding insult to injury, uh, six years ago, Harvard Business School Press decided their 500 most popular articles, they were gonna remove uh, downloading and printing options. And Michael Porter is probably one of the most popular marketing uh, academicians out there. And so if you bring up that article, this is why I get angry at Harvard, you see. So students still can read it by clicking on the PDF on the left side with this is one of the 500 that they just can't print or download. Now, as I mentioned in working with the professor earlier, he really wanted the students to have a print copy. So he decided that they should purchase it from Harvard Business School Press. Again, that would be a um, choice that you would make as a professor. Now, again, this is the only one of all of those that they don't have, you can't create persistent links into that. Now, Harvard takes this so seriously that Widener, their own library on campus, got a cease and desist letter for creating a persistent link. We're gonna move on to books now. All right, and the TARDIS again will take us there. Now, you can look for electronic books through the book catalog. 
or you could go into specific collections that we subscribe to via the databases. And our strongest three, our largest, are probably eBook Central, Oxford, and Credo. All right, so you're going to find that we have 180,000 plus academic titles, and these are scholarly university press titles. So if you're looking for 50 shades of something or another, you're not going to find it here. All right, so the first one we're going to look at is the library catalog. So I had a professor who wanted to assign his students uh, this book. So what we did is we put it in the library catalog, we searched for it, and it showed that we had an electronic version. And by clicking on the blue book, uh, blue box that said view ebook, or this is the advanced search of the library catalog that we did as well. Got the same result. It took us to eBook Central. Now, what the professor could do is, again, do you see that chain link there? He could put that link into Moodle and students would have access to it. Now, this is for the entire book. Now, he also could choose by opening up the various chapters in the book, he could put links to the specific chapters if he wished. Again, this incurs no additional expense for the student, and they can read it at a time and a place of their choosing. That is called eBook Central, and there are 160,000 titles in eBook Central. Again, any of those would be available to you and your students. And right now, all of those titles are multiple users, so that more than one student could be accessing it at one time. And this is what we paid for our paying for eBook Central this year. The next one I want to look at is Oxford. Okay, historically, Augsburg has always purchased for the social work department the um, Oxford Encyclopedia of Social Work. Well, four years ago, I believe it was now the 30th edition, they no longer did a print version it was only electronic. And in contacting our sales rep, I said, oh, they're only doing electronic. Well, the decision was made by these publishers that they were gonna do monthly updates. So every month they were sending some new information, new materials, and that simply would not be possible if it was a print version. So we subscribed and professors in that department or any department, could put links to any of the articles into their Moodle page and then students would have access or they could direct the students to browse the encyclopedia itself if they wanted to. And at that time, then um, Oxford then developed encyclopedias in other subject areas. And our first interest came from the religion department who then said, they particularly at the time were interested in the section on the Reformation, but they found that there were other areas that were of great interest. Now, we currently subscribe to nine other subject encyclopedias other than social work and religion at the cost of 11,310. So again, uh, this would be political science, uh, education, psychology, etc. So again, links could be put into Moodle for any of these. One other thing we subscribe to is Oxford Reference. So that is a collection of reference books, all by a single publisher, uh, Oxford Reference. And the cost right now is 2,724. I'm gonna go back and mention that it is 326 titles, all by Oxford. Now this would give you an alternative to the Wikipedia results that some of your students are handing in. But speaking of that nature of Wikipedia, the next thing that I'd like to speak to is Credo. Now, whereas Oxford Reference was all a single publisher, this is 117 different publishers. So again, links can be made. You see in the upper right there, the chain link fence. So to begin your class or a unit or a uh, chapter with a common definition. So we can take any from any of these four, uh, 943 titles. And again, 
you'll find that there are links that could be made into Moodle. And the cost is 5369 Now, business models for those. Let's look at how these work. Okay, just to recap. So one would go to the library homepage for access. There are the films, the major vendors that we use. If you're looking, if we have a specific journal, you could go to journal by title. Now, for example, if you know that a journal lives in a specific database, then you could go directly to the database itself to locate it. And we talked about the eBooks. And I, as I mentioned, you could go directly to the library catalog, or you could go to one of our specific uh, vendors via the database listing. So the TARDIS is taking on our adventure, but keep in mind that these are things that we pay for. So you would be well to leverage any of these. Um, they all come from uh, highly referred, uh, ref reviewed sources, excuse me. Okay, so again, but does it meet your course objective? And they would provide access. Does it save cost? in the sense of time, money, and stress level. Now, as I mentioned, there's a cost to you to help set it up. So as you're creating your adventure, if you feel like you're flying by the seat of your pants, or you feel like just everything's upside down, your library liaison can help you to navigate some of this and see what's available for you. And also your liaison for computing, your LFC can assist as well. All right, so the TARDIS is taken, so we wish you safe travels as you create your educational adventures for students. And remember, librarians can help you find and use electronic resources. All right, thank you. And as Mike mentioned, we'll take questions a little bit later. And so I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague now. So I'll stop sharing my screen. All right, thanks, Rowan. Um, hi, everyone, my name is Caroline Watt. I am the Student Success Librarian here at Augsburg. And for the next half hour or so, we are going to move away from items that the library licenses and move into open educational resources, or OER, which are teaching and learning materials that are available on the open web. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen now. All right. Um, so a little bit of context for this presentation. I am in the midst of completing an OER librarianship certificate that is run through the Open Textbook Network. That's a community of higher ed institutions that promote access, affordability, and student success through the use of open textbooks. Um, that's run by our neighbors at the University of Minnesota. So we are in good local company um, as we explore this for our own campus. I also used an OER this semester as I taught the library's first iteration of our credit-bearing information literacy course. So throughout this presentation, I will bring in my own experiences with finding and using OER um, and explain sort of my perspective, not only as a librarian who's excited to help you find OER, um, but as a as an instructor who uses them myself. So um, let's move on, maybe, there we go, um, to a quick overview of what we are going to cover in the next half hour or so. Um, we'll talk about what OER are, and because there are some misconceptions about OER that are fairly prevalent in higher ed, we will also talk about what OER are not. We'll cover some of the advantages of using OER in your classroom, and we'll finish by talking about how you can find OER and how your friendly local librarians can support you in finding and implementing OER in your classroom. So to kick off, um, I want to make sure we're all on the same page and talk a little bit about something that might seem pretty basic, which is what are OER. Um, when we say that in the library, we mean teaching and learning materials that you may freely use and you reuse at no cost without needing to ask permission. Um, that definition comes from OER Commons, 
which is a virtual community and platform for OER users. And I want to spend a couple minutes unpacking one particular part of this definition, which is uh, the phrase use and reuse. There are a couple rights that are implied in that phrase that kind of um, make something OER. And those rights are known as the five R's. Um, they are retain, which is the right to make, own, and control copies of content. Reuse, which is the right to use the content in a wide range of ways. So you could use something in the classroom or in a video or in your book club. Revise is the right to adapt, adjust, or modify the content itself. So a revision might be if you translate the content into another language um, or if you change it into a different file format. Remixing is the right to combine the content with other material to create something new. That would be like a mashup or if you um, update the content with your own words. And redistributing is the right to give away copies of the content. So I share that just to bring us all onto the same page that OER are a lot more than just a free textbook. Um, they come with all of these additional freedoms that offer you some interesting pedagogical opportunities, which we'll get into a little later. So OER get all of these freedoms, the five R's, in one of two ways. The first way would be that they are openly licensed. Um, this openly licensed material is most of what we're going to talk about when we talk about OER. Um, open licenses are legal tools that creators use to retain copyright, but still get credit for their work um, while they're allowing users to take those freedoms, those, those five R freedoms. Um, so for textbooks and images, the most common type of open license is Creative Commons. Everything that you see on this slide is something that was licensed under Creative Commons. Um, so this means that users can adapt these works in different ways. That's why we get so many Cards Against Humanity knockoffs, and that's why the Arduino microcontroller is uh, able to be used in so many different inventions because um, you're allowed to take that and then remix it with something else of your own creation. The second way that things get these permissions to revise, remix, etc., is that they enter the public domain. Um, there are a whole patchwork of different laws and circumstances that determine if something is in the public domain. And we're not going to get into all of the details here, but very generally, um, if something was published in the U.S. before 1924, it is in the public domain. Uh, your librarian can help you figure out the details if you come to us with a specific example of something that you suspect might be in the public domain, but you're not sure. So um, let's end this definition section by talking about a couple of misconceptions. And the first is that people um, OER are only textbooks. Um, most often, OER, when people say OER, they're referring to textbooks. That's mostly what we're going to focus on in this presentation, but it can be so many things. Um, OER can be images, they can be sound files or videos, they can be supplementary materials like slides, uh, syllabi, assessment tools. Software can be OER. Um, Software is kind of the, the root of the open education movement. Um, and Moodle actually could be considered an OER. And I know we're all very familiar with that now. Um, so as we talk about this, I would just encourage you to keep in the back of your mind that um, although we're going to focus on textbooks, um, there are a lot of other possibilities. The second misconception that I want to clear up is that because OER are free to students, um, there's this idea that you get what you pay for and these textbooks are somehow of a lower quality. So I just want to clarify that these are or can be high quality resources. 
The publishers that we will look at today that I'll highlight for you later include peer review and regular updates in their publishing workflows. The books that we'll look at are affiliated with universities or professional organizations, and they enjoy widespread use across institutions. One publisher that we're going to look at, OpenStax, has reached something like a 10% market share in the subjects that it covers. So when we're talking about OER, I just don't want you to think that I'm suggesting we're using our students as guinea pigs. Many of these resources have been tried and true at other universities um, and have been proven to be high quality resources. This isn't to say that every OER is perfect, just as not every textbook is perfect, but I think that the idea that you have to pay for quality is both pervasive and maybe a little outdated in higher ed. Um, to be clear, someone is paying for the production of these texts, but it's generally a university that has decided that providing open and accessible knowledge is important to its mission. It's not our students who are paying for the high quality text. So now that we've got a shared understanding of what OER are, um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about why you might consider using them. Uh, we'll focus on three separate reasons. Those are saving students money, enabling student success, and using OER pedagogy to support active and sustainable learning. Um, so the first element that we'll focus on is saving students money. I think we've all learned this semester just how precarious many of our students' financial situations are. Once we moved online, I know I found out, and I think a lot of us found out, how many hours our students work to be able to afford their education and support their families. So OER are usually free for students to use, and this can make a huge difference for students given the price of textbooks. Speaking of which, I want to uh, draw your attention to this one chart on the slide. Um, this is a graph from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, it was published and I think it was the data came out in 2017. It's capturing up till July 2016. So it's a few years old. Um, but it illustrates the rate of inflation of textbook prices against other education related expenses. So uh, you see up here, textbooks are the, the thing that shoots up the highest um, with other education expenses falling well below it and all of the education related expenses far outstripping the rate of inflation for all items. Um, so this cost, this textbook cost all the way up here, is both really high, as you can see, but it's also very hard to budget for. Um, textbook prices change for students every semester based on what courses they're taking, and it's hard for students to tell at the outset if they'll be able to save money by renting or selling their textbooks back. Um, sometimes you don't know if you can rent a textbook till you get to the bookstore. Sometimes you don't know if you'll be able to sell it back until the beginning of the next semester when the next set of students start taking that course. Um, so budgeting for textbook prices can be really hard for students. In my personal experience, cost was kind of the deciding factor when we decided to use an OER for the library's information literacy course. We did have some flexibility because we were building the course from scratch. So um, that, that was one thing that we had an advantage on, I would say, many other courses that might be considering a transition to OER, is we haven't built our course with another textbook in mind. Um, but we also found that um, in a time two course, we would have several students who might pick up the class unexpectedly. Um, we had students registering for the class up until the day it started on March 3rd. And so we thought they might not be planning at the beginning of the semester on budgeting for this textbook, and it might be an unexpected cost if they wait until March 3rd to, to check on textbook prices for their new course. Um, 
So those are the two reasons that we elected to go with an OER. We had the flexibility to, and we just, um, it was very important to us that we take the step of saving our students money. So the second reason that you might consider OER for your own class is student success. Um, I don't think it's a secret that many students try to get by without the textbook due to the cost. And one benefit of o using OER is that there is no cost barrier for students having access to the text on the very first day of class. This is one way to level the playing field between students who are waiting on financial aid refunds before they can pay for their textbooks and students who aren't reliant on financial aid to pay for their texts. Um, if, the, if the textbook is online, all students can access it from the very first day of, of the course. So I also want to bring up the possibility that students anticipate affordability issues and they construct their schedules accordingly. So on the screen now are some partial results of a survey of over 20,000 college students. Uh, this is from Florida. And they show that students report taking fewer courses, not registering for courses, or dropping courses due to the textbook costs in addition to not buying the required text, as we discussed earlier. So um, we know that the short-term savvy that students exhibit by not buying the textbook or dropping a course has long-term impacts on the student's ability to progress through their degrees in the anticipated time. But our students, and especially our students who are unfamiliar with higher ed systems and structures, might not know that. So choosing an OER for your course and advertising that this is a course that is free of any kind of hidden fees with your textbooks um, might help a student make their course choices based on the utility of the class to them and the ability of that class to help them progress towards their degree um, instead of the cost, which ultimately helps us as a university fulfill the promise that we're making to our students of a four-year degree. So the third reason that I want to talk about for why OER are an empowering choice that um, you can make for your classroom is OER enabled pedagogy. So there's a saying that there's no such thing as a perfect textbook. Um, that is true. But the ability to revise and remix OER empowers you as the instructor to create learning materials that correspond to the specific needs of your community. So either by mashing up your texts with other texts or adding your own material to update a textbook, you get to tailor materials to best serve your students and get a little bit closer to this idea of the perfect textbook. Um, Ron spent a lot of time talking about choosing your own adventure earlier by drawing on different library resources. OER and being able to remix and update OER is kind of an extension of choosing your adventure. Um, you get to take a little bit from different resources and create one new experience that best serves your students. Students also get to retain their materials after class is over um, if you choose OER. The way that traditional textbooks uh, are distributed now, there is a financial incentive to return them at the end of the year, either because they were rented to lower the upfront cost or because students can sell them back to other students. With an OER, students have the right to keep their copy of the book as long as they want. Um, and then they can keep drawing from the material that they learned in your course in other courses. They can always go back to the, what they learned in your course and um, refer to that and use it to, to build in other courses. So the last thing I have here is something called renewable assignments. Um, as you try to align your course with principles of open, open education and the open movement, you might also consider 
what we're calling renewable assignments, which is when you take advantage of the 5R privileges by having students create and contribute to OER. Um, I have found this to be very empowering as an experiential learning opportunity because it gives students a chance to take ownership of and make changes to their learning materials. So some examples of this, um, I've seen assignments where instructors invite students to remix their textbook um, to make it more relevant to their specific situations. Um, assignments where students contribute to open education platforms like Wikipedia. Um, assignments where students update art in the public domain to make it relevant to their course content. Things like that. So open assignments give students a chance to contribute to the scholarly conversation by creating and putting their creations out into the world. Um, these also make pretty good portfolio pieces. And so if this is something that you'd like to explore, please just reach out. I would love to send you some more examples of what renewable assignments can look like. So now we are going to transition to the good stuff, which is actually finding OER. Um, I am going to take us to a new library guide um, on open educational resources. This link is also available from the faculty resources page, or if you go to the guides drop down, that's available at any library page. Just scroll down to open educational resources and you will end up right here. So this first page is mostly just a summary of what we've already talked about. The second page is going to be where you want to go to start the process of searching for and finding OER to use in your classroom. So I just want to highlight a few of the resources on this page. The first box um, is what I consider to be some of the best bets as far as OER go. So we've got OpenStax, Open SUNY, and Libre texts here. Um, these are all associated with major universities. OpenStax comes out of Rice University. Open SUNY is obviously the SUNY system. And I think Libre Texts is the UC system. Um, I considered these, these three producers to just be very credible. Not only do they come from um, large research universities, but they also all go through peer review processes um, and include updates and errata in their publishing workflows. And so, um, these, these, I would say, are kind of your best bets. The Open Textbook Library is, it has similar standards, but it's consolidating materials from many different publishers into one platform. So the Open Textbook Library is not actually a publisher, but a repository that contains um, many different publishers' works in one place. It's a database. Um, so I want to go into OpenStax to talk about a few of the access options. Um, so we can, we can talk about kind of how you direct your students to this particular, uh, this particular text. So let's find a random textbook. Great. Um, so the first way that you can have your students access uh, a textbook through an open, open educational resources platform like this one would just be to have them download the entire textbook. Um, so we see, we see here there's an option to download the entire PDF. They keep that on their computer um, and they can access it as needed. You can also have the students access the book in the browser. Um, so this is the way that you would kind of get the book into Moodle, the way that Ron showed us with persistent links. Um, you would go to the table of contents, choose whatever you want them to read. We're having them read all of chapter two, let's say. So we'll go to the first part of chapter two here. And then for OER, you can actually just uh, copy the link up here in the URL page and get that directly into Moodle. So I'll show you what that looked like. Um, this is how I did it in my course. Um, I, in, in that top 
section of Moodle that kind of has the stuff that is useful throughout the whole course, in addition to guidelines for assignments and things like that. The syllabus, I put a link to the, the textbook and then every time they had a reading, um, I could either just refer them to the textbook or I could copy the link to the specific, um, the specific chapter that I wanted them to read and create a link just like this. So one more access option that I want to show you, if we can get over there. Great. Um, is the ability to order a print copy at production cost. So students would go to uh, the platform's website and um, they have the ability to order a printed copy. Um, so this is really nice if you don't think that um, you want your students to use technology in the classroom. Um, it's just a way it's just a way around that. They, they have the ability to order a printed copy. Um, if you don't feel that they need to order a printed copy, you can also have them print out the specific sections at um, campus printers like the one in the library. Or if they need the textbook in the classroom, you could just have them have their devices out when you need the textbook and then put it away when you're done. Um, but there are ways around, you know, if you're using a digital textbook, you don't have to have computers out every moment in the classroom. And so I just wanted to show you the ability to order a print copy as one way that you can kind of get around, get around using a computer all the time while you're in the classroom. Um, so let's go back actually to the OER guide. I want to show you a couple other sections here. Um, OER repositories are databases that contain material from many different OER producers. Um, Open Textbook Library was the one that I put in our best bet section, just because I think that is the one that's easiest to use. Um, but a couple other ones that I want to highlight are also in this guide. OER Commons um, contains materials beyond just textbooks. Mason OER MetaFinder searches, it's a federated search that um, performs your search simultaneously in 22 different uh, OER producers platforms. And so um, these have more specific search functions, um, they have more content, and they also contain more ancillary materials, things like syllabi and slides. Um, so if you're not finding what you like with one of the best bets up here, um, these are also worth checking out. You also have access to uh, folks in the library who would love to help you out. So I've also included on this LibGuide um, a form that you can fill out if you want librarians to do some initial searching for you. Um, so you would just fill this out with the name of your course, um, your department and some concepts that you'd like the book to cover. Um, and we would love to do the initial digging for you. Uh, we're not subject experts in the way that you're a subject expert, but um, we can weed out a lot of the stuff you don't want to see and um, present you with just a few good options. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that or you can email your library liaison as well, and they would be happy to do some searching for you. That brings us to the last point here, um, which is how the library can support you as you look at exploring OER. Um, so conducting an initial OER search and evaluation, we've already talked about that. Um, there's that form on the OER LibGuide, or you can email your liaison, and we would be happy to look into some possibilities for you. We also plan to create opportunities for further learning about OER on campus. Um, conveniently, Open Access Week falls in the middle of the fall semester, and Open Education Week falls in the middle of spring semester. So we're planning to offer programming for both. 
Um, I know that a lot is up in the air right now, and it might seem like the worst possible time to change more than you absolutely need to for your class. Um, so our goal in offering regular workshops, you know, in the middle of the semesters and during training opportunities like this, um, in addition to our efforts to kind of build a community of OER enthusiasts here on campus, is that if you're interested, but maybe now isn't the right time for you to make a switch to another textbook, um, we want to be there for you when you are ready. And so just keep an eye out for further opportunities for learning um, and let us know if there's something that you're interested in learning more about as you think about exploring OER. The last way that the library is really looking forward to supporting ad OER adoption on campus um, is kind of serving as the campus data center. Um, so if we all actually hop back to our LibGuide here, um, we'd like to collect some information from faculty who do choose to adopt OER so we can we can better understand just how much money we're saving and how much impact we're having on our students. Um, so if you adopted an OER, we would ask you how many students are in your class, um, what the name of your previous textbook was, um, how much money students were paying for the previous textbook, or if you are not replacing a textbook, um, we might ask you, um, what a typical textbook in your in your classes or in your subjects price range would look like. Um, so this is just so that we can better understand and justify continued use and exploration of OER on campus. Um, and once we know that you are adopting or thinking of adopting an OER, um, that just gives us another opportunity to reach out to you, support you, and hopefully we will be able to grow the open movement and open education um, the community around that at augsburg into an additional way that we can fulfill our mission of equipping students to succeed so of oh, some icon attributions um, the icons were licensed under a creative commons license um, so i thought that would be a good addition to this presentation and with that, I think we are ready for questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen and peek at the chat here. <laughs>